Hello and welcome to our second single factor and NOVA exercise. This is another completely randomized design, which of course means that the researcher has some control over how the treatments are applied to the experimental units. Let's just jump into this one. This is our second exercise. If you've watched the introduction to this segment, you have a fairly good idea, I hope, of the methodology. We'll go through this. I'll talk a little bit about each step as we go, and hopefully everything will sink in for you. A new type of glass is being produced uh, to use in areas at risk of earthquakes. Three types of glass have been developed, but the company only wishes to manufacture one. In order to test the strength of the glass, window panes of identical sizes were placed in a machine designed to shake the glass in a manner that simulates the stress it would endure in an earthquake. In the most severe earthquakes, the shaking can last as long as five minutes. The amount of time before each window pane shattered is recorded. The following table has our summary statistics. Okay, so we've got three different types of glass. Here I can see, whoops, I've got three different sample sizes. We have our sample means and we have our sample standard deviations. So. As with all ANOVAs, what we're going to do here is produce an ANOVA table that clearly partitions the different sources of variation that exists in this data set. So again, we treat this data set as one, right? We treat it as though the null hypothesis is true. And the null hypothesis in this case is that the average of the first type of glass is the same as the second is the same as the third. The alternative hypothesis is simply that not all of them, not all are equal. So if we treat this as though the null is true, right? This is our assumption. Then what we are going to do is say, okay, here's the total variation that exists in that sample. All of our samples together treating it as one. Then we want to partition out those two different sources of variation. There's that source of variation which can be attributed to differences, if any, between treatments and that which is random noise within each of those treatments. So in order to do that, we're going to produce this ANOVA table that shows clearly these different sources of variation. So here we'll have our source of variation. We'll have the two different sums of squares, the degrees of freedom, which that first column sums of squares divided by degrees of freedom gives us our mean square, which then we can find our F, our P, and we'll also have here some critical value. So the first one is always going to be that source of variation from treatments. So here this first square, this one right here, is SSTR, right? The sum of squares sum of squares due to treatment. The next one here, this is going to be sum of squares due to error, and then we'll add those up and we'll get sum of squares total. So the first thing, the first step, well, after you state your null and alternative, the next step is that for our calculation of SSTR, we need the grand mean, that point estimate of the common population mean uh, that it exists under the assumption that they're all the same, right? If the null hypothesis is true, those sample means, those population means are all the same. They all come from one distribution that has one common population mean. What's our best guess of that mean? That's X double bar, the grand mean. So in order to do that, again, your first reaction, your first go-to formula should be 
this weighted average. If and only if your sample sizes are the same, then this condenses into a fairly straightforward calculation where you're looking at the mean of the means, the average of your three sample means. Here I can see that my sample sizes are not all the same. So here I need to use this weighted average calculation. So this is going to be 13 times that first sample mean plus the next one is 10 times its sample mean. The next one is 11 times its sample mean. We divide that by the total, 13 plus 10 plus 11. And so this gives me 13 times 5.3 plus 10 times 5.6 plus 11 times 5.7 divided by 13 plus 10 plus 11. So that gives me a grand mean equal to 5.518. So now we've got that first intermediate step taken care of. Now we can go ahead and calculate SSTR, where SSTR here we're looking at the sum across those differences between sample means and the grand mean squared. And here we are multiplying through by the sample size. So the first one, our sample size was 13 times that mean. Here is 5.3. Oops. 5.3 and the grand mean 5.518 squared. Then the next one, our sample size was 10 and our sample mean was 5.6. So 10, 5.6 minus 518 squared plus, and the next one here was 11, sample mean 5.7. squared. Okay, now we'll figure out what that is. We're going to do this in steps just to make my life a little bit easier and to avoid any frustrating mistakes, which I think I already am making. 5.3 minus 5.518 squared times 13. So this first term, let's go like this, is 0.618 plus 5.6 minus 518 squared times 10, 0 0.067 and 5.7 minus 5.518 squared times 11. It's so easy to make silly mistakes. I'm making them all over the place. Times 11, and here we have 0 0.364. Now we'll add those together. And I have 1.0. Finally, 1.05. So we've got our first square SSTR, degrees of freedom for SSTR, K minus 1, K being the number of treatments that we have. Once more, I have type 1, 2, and 3. So 3 minus 1 is 2. 1.05 divided by 2 gives me MSE 0.525. Okay, next one, SSE. SSE is looking at adding up 
nj minus 1 times that standard deviation squared, so the variance. So here I have our first one was 13 minus 1, and that standard deviation here is 0.62. The next one is 10 minus 1 times its standard deviation, 0.55 squared. The next one, 11. Whoops, 11 minus 1. 11 minus 1 times its standard deviation, 0.59. And here I go, 12 times 0.62 squared, plus 9 times 0.55 squared, plus 10 times 0.59 squared. And that gives me a SSE of 10.82. Okay, 10.82 for SSE, degrees of freedom here, NT minus K. So NT, I'm adding up our three sample sizes. So here I have 13, 23, and 34. I have K equals three, so I have 31 degrees of freedom. 10.82 divided by 31 gives me MSE 0.349. Okay, almost there. Now to be complete, we'll add up SSTR and SSE, and that gives me my SST of 1187. This degrees of freedom, NT minus one. Here we had 34 degrees, uh, 34 observations. 34 minus one is 33 which, as we can see, is also 31 plus 2. Next, our test statistic. So that F is just 0.525 over 0.349, always MSTR over MSE, 0.525 over 0.349. That gives me an F stat of 1.504. Okay, no problem, right? Next step, as always, we go to our F tables. Now that we've got that test statistic we want to look up, does it lie in our rejection region? Does it give me a p-value smaller than my level of significance? Here we don't have a level of significance specified, so let's choose 5%. We need to know our variant of the F distribution, so I look at our degrees of freedom here. I have two in the numerator. I have 31 in the denominator. So that critical value for our test has two numerator and 31 denominator degrees of freedom. Now, be very careful here. Notice not dividing alpha by two. Yes, this looks like it's a two-tailed test. You see those equalities, and right away you're thinking two-tailed test. But remember this methodology that we're using. This is that MSTR over MSE. And remember from the introductory video to this module that we are essentially testing to see whether MSTR is greater than MSE, statistically significantly greater than MSE. Why? Because MSE is an unbiased estimate of the population variance. Unbiased in the sense it doesn't matter if the knowledge of the alternative is true, MSE is not influenced by that. But MSTR, as we can see in this calculation, if the alternative is true, those distances between sample means and grand means, those distances are going to be large if the alternative is true. And so if, if the alternative is true and those distances are large, then MSTR is large, and we say it's an inflated estimate of the population variance. 
So this is an upper tail F test to determine if MSTR is significantly greater than MSE. So let's go to our F tables. I have 2 and 31 degrees of freedom. So I'm coming down, down, down. And here I have 2 and 31, I don't have, so we'll round that to 30. And so here are our relevant values. Now, my test statistic here is roughly, let's just say 1.5. So when I look at my table, 1.5, well, 1.5 is smaller than the smallest. So if I look at this F distribution, something like this, well, here I have a critical value for alpha 0.05. That critical value is 3.316. That leaves me an area in that tail of 0.05. Well, our test statistic is somewhere down here, 1.05. And as always, that critical value, that defines where we reject and where we do not reject. So looking at that critical value approach, I'm clearly in the do not reject space. And when we look at the best that we can do for our p-value, well, the smallest value I have is 2 point, call that 2.5. I'll just round it because we don't need to be precise here. So that's 2.5 and that's a probability of 0.1. So here's 2.5 and that's a probability here of 0.1. Well, my test statistic is way out here which means that probability must be something greater than 0.1. So we have our results. I have our p-value for this test is greater than 0.1 with alpha, let's write everything in here, that test statistic, F critical 3.3. We, we have insufficient evidence here to reject. Our evidence in this case does not support the alternative hypotheses. Our evidence in this case supports the null hypothesis. We have no reason to believe that any one of these three types of glass can withstand the shake from an earthquake any better. All three of these glasses, as far as we can tell, have the same capability of withstanding that, that length of time shaking from an earthquake. Okay, so that's it for this exercise. Here we can see Performa Fisher's LSD if necessary. This being the key phrase, if necessary, because we are not rejecting the null hypotheses. We've already found no reason to believe that a difference exists. Therefore, it is not necessary that we look for a difference. So Fisher's LSD, not necessary. We are finished. Thank you all for watching. Hope this was helpful. Bye-bye.